Welcome to the Market Geometry Morning Mentoring Sessions. It's Thursday, October 22nd. It's about 166 degrees Fahrenheit in Chennai, India. Oh, never mind. It's rainy and cold and dark in Chicago, which is where I am, unfortunately. And um, thought we'd uh, go at it. Christian wants to know. Christian wants me to go right to the chart that says on the S&P 500, it's over. He wants to prove me wrong. Well, instead, actually, uh, people ask me why I do mentoring, why I talk to other traders, why I don't just sit in my little castle here, um, the place I call home with my nice little trading room, lock myself up in my room, make my money, and uh, have nothing to do with the rest of the world. And the answer is... It works kind of, sort of, but I did pronounce it perfectly. Huh? Chennai, perfectly. Okay, that's good. Um, that's that's amazing. Believe me, it was a dead guess. Um, I get something out of mentoring that's extremely important to me as well as, first of all, I, I give a, I, when people tell me that, uh, you know, the mentoring or the, the teaching that I do even day to day, whatever, um, helps them, obviously that that's good for my soul. And that's why I started it. I'm trying to give back. I'm in the give back period. I hope in the end that people will look back and see that I've left some amount of legacy. I've carried on Dr. Andrew's work and uh, and some other people's work. Uh, but also, when I teach, I learn. My father taught me, for everything you give, you get a thousand back. Um, and I think that's certainly true when you teach. So I want to take a look at a trade quickly. Um, and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see... Um, how messy this, this chart is, but um, let, let me squeeze in a little bit here. This is Canada, 240 minutes. Eh, that's not as messy as I thought. Okay. You can't see it all. Um, let me go see if I can grab more bars. I probably can't, but um, maximum bars, 64,000. Let me see if I can grab more. I probably can't. Um, you know, I've made... Uh, Great, uh, I mean, no no bones. I guess you can't see the last pivot point up there on this one. But um, I made no bones about um, with my children. Uh, my father never gave us any money for college. If you wanted to go to college, we had eight kids. Um, we worked on the weekends. He worked 20 hours. Hey, Paul, how are you? Um, hey, Andy. Um, if you wanted to go to college, you had to earn your way. Uh, when my scholarship ran out at the University of Chicago, I had to disappear for a quarter until uh, I could find a way to um, find $3,500 a year. My father would not sign for the note, period. didn't matter. And um, it might sound mean because I'm not in the same financial position as my father, but I actually think that gave something to me. And I know people say, why don't you just give all this stuff away? I think the things that you cherish the most in life and the things you learn the most in life are the things that you earn and they're so while i don't want things to be exorbitant i do want them always to have a price on them because i do think you actually cherish and learn more from all information that you work harder for that's why i make you work for the weekly lessons or for the step-by-step -step lessons it's why you things aren't free free some things are free but most things have some price on them um for my children um i told them they asked me at one point you know, they're getting the age you know eight nine ten eleven where they're thinking about college a little bit way in the back of their mind and they asked me whether or not they were i was going to pay for their college and i asked sean well where do you want to go to school and he told me university of chicago i said well that's going to be about by the time you go it's going to be i don't know half a million dollars claude says what has a price is valued that's exactly right i think and you have to earn it so i said you know you better get, you better get cracking because you got half a million dollars to earn my friend you got a little time but yeah, people really don't realize the worth of something that is abundantly freely available. I agree, Krishna. People in business, especially sales, have said, I recognize that a free commodity has no perceived value to the recipient. You value it when you have to work or pay for it. And I think that's true for individual. Well, it's free in Denmark. You know, there's a lot of things that fill up. There's a lot of things I like in Denmark. I like that you guys bit the bullet on energy and put in uh, renewable energy. There's a lot of good things there. But there's a lot of good things in America although they've started to go bad, I think, in the last 10 years, but uh, that I would I would argue that Denmark doesn't have. So, hey, A.K., how are you? So anyway, my idea to my kids were, you know, you want some money? Earn it. 
I even tell them, for example, they don't have Greenspan. <laughs> Eduardo says, okay. they can, no, they can have Greenspan. Anyway, uh, I told them, hey, you can earn it. In fact, I'll even put up the money if you want to do something entrepreneurial, like, for example, you know, Velda the Snail, uh, if you want to sell books, if you want to whatever. And Sean said to me one day that he wanted to make a trade. So he started doing hand charts with me. And we're not going to go, uh, it's the people who get the Pell Grants to college that now want free health care. There you go. Well, I didn't get Pell Grants. I got uh, lots of scholarships and lots of loans, but um, I got nothing for my parents. So I told my kids that they had to earn their way. Sean wanted to make a trade. Um, he made an oil trade, which we're not going to go over today. But the reason I'm going to bring this up is because in speaking on Monday, if any 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 of you any remember later in the session someone had asked me if i was going to move my stop up now above 106 or maybe 116 i don't and you know i said cavalierly i don't know what do you guys think and we all took a vote some people said no stick with the plan some people said take make sure you put a stop in some people said take the money and run etc cetera, etc cetera. and what i said was at the end of the session i thought about it for a while i said i'm going to put in a bid at 103.31 and a stop above the prior high and we'll look at that in a minute here. Um, and if one of them gets hit, that's fine. Um, and the reason why I said that is because, and you may or may not remember this, when we were looking at beans mm, about two months ago, maybe three months ago, Paul made an off-the-cuff comment that I repeated. Hey, Tim. And uh, what, his, what his comment was was, your view on beans is clouding your ability to trade this market. You see some great entries, but you're not taking them because your long-term view is, is clouding your ability to trade it. And that was absolutely true. Now, does anybody remember that? Yeah, Paul says, and here you go, I remember Monday thinking that you weren't trading your usual style, that dynamic risk-reward ratio was just awful. I mentioned then it's time to take the money and run. Yep, and I said, after thinking about it for a little while, I went, uh, I'm going to put in a bid at a 103.31 and a stop above the recent highs. So let's take a look at the trade real quick. You can't see the, unfortunately, you can't see the fork that spawned this. But it had this beautiful stop, and this is Lucy. Lucy didn't like the oil trade that Sean liked, and Sean made a, a grillion dollars on his two oil trades. Uh, no, I didn't keep anything, Michael. You know what I decided? I don't feel well. I'm just going to get all of my, you know, hopefully I'll get out. Hi, Chef. Uh, if not, I'll get stopped out of all my positions and just have no positions. I'll, I'll look at trades at the markets for a couple of weeks, get healthy, um, because clearly I'm, I'm not thinking clearly. So let's take a look. I wanted to ask you uh, a timely question or two from yesterday's archives. Has the new book been put out yet? No, it hasn't, Tim. I remember it, it being spoken about. Everything is everything has been put back, Tim Downey, because I don't know if you've been here in the last couple of days. Um, there's been some health implications, and I, I'm extremely ill. Um, I'm going to do the morning things every day, but at the moment, everything has to be slowed down for a little bit. So, um, If I was talking about a book, I was talking about the original book. So anyway. No position is a trade to. That's exactly right, Andy. I'm in the no trade. Yeah, I'm in the no trade now for everything, but especially for the ones where I just took a lot of money out. You're right, Paul. So here we go. We got short up in here in the Canada. We took some out here. We put some back out in here. We took it all two thirds of it off at 108. Magnificent trade. Left one third on. Sat through this run up. Okay. And we're talking about a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Sat through all this. Now, on Monday, we're down here. Or let me, let me play the. Monday, we're down here. In fact, we'd been all the way down. Look, all remember, we'd been all the way down to here. And almost hit, fellas, 10031. Well, not almost. Low was 101.99 or something like that. Low was 102 even. Uh, how about that? So. Oh, 
Oh, uh, Tim Downey says, uh, uh, you mentioned my brother introduced me to Dr. Anderson. Is it the same brother that I mentioned that a week or so about the market going up? Actually, no. My, the brother that introduced me to Dr. Andrews died in a car accident in 1985. Um, he was driving his Jaguar uh, too fast, reading the newspaper. No, it's okay. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not a touchy subject anymore. Driving his Jaguar too fast on a highway in Florida in a foggy, about 7 o'clock in the morning, it was kind of foggy, reading the newspaper at the same time. He had a proclivity of doing that every morning, even though I told him not to. Thank God I wasn't riding with him that morning. And uh, a truck that was not allowed to be in that lane going about 10 miles an hour, uh, he ran right into it. A, a loaded stone truck. He never felt anything, trust me. Um, and it was a... Uh, it was fault on both sides. How's that? The truck shouldn't have been in that lane uh, and on that road, and he should obviously should never have been driving and reading. So, anyway, here we go. He has three wonderful children, and uh, and uh, I I love them, love them all, and take care of them. But that's a whole different story. Anyway, um, we're, here we are on Monday, and I cavalierly said, I don't know what he, somebody said. Are you going to snug it up underneath? I think this high was the talk. And I said, I don't know. I think, it'll, I think it's going to parody. I'm not worried about it. And Paul said, amongst others, Paul, you, weren't the, you actually weren't alone. Several other people said, isn't the risk-reward? Remember, we're, we're Long Canada at 124. It's down at 102. I'm trying to get it out at 10031, so I'm risking one cent and one cent and one dollar and 70 cents. How about that? To make, I'm, I'm trying to make a dollar seventy cents, and I'm willing to risk all the way back up to one nineteen. So, it's one divided by nineteen is risk reward. Talk about a bad dynamic risk reward. Everybody get that? It's about one one twentieth, one eighteenth. All right. And I cavalierly said, I don't think I want to move it. I think I, I think it's going to make it to parity. Then. Paul and several other people said, you know, what about the risk, what about the dynamic risk reward? Yes, and Paul says, people should really think about this. We all do it from time to time. I thought about it for about five minutes. Remember, I asked you, I took a poll, remember? Some people said, keep it, don't worry about it, it's going to go there. Some people said you should put a risk, put a stop in above the recent highs, which are up in here. Not a bad idea. Other people just said, Take the money and run. Michael Jackson said, leave 100000 on for chuckles, take everything else off, right? What I ended up doing is, and I said at the end, I'm going to put a stop, I'm going to put a bid in at 103. I can't remember if it was 11 or 31. I think it was 31. 103, 31. And a stop over the recent highs. And in the back of my mind, I was saying, boy, I hope it just comes down and takes me out because I'd like to get out of this position. But there's a fine edge that you walk when you trade. 103, 11, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, several people remember. Okay, good. Um, and, and we talked about it yesterday in mentoring. Uh, I, I stopped in a group mentoring. We talked about it briefly before I headed out. But um, there's a fine line that you walk between sticking with a plan and being... Because um, um, I know a lot of you would like to learn to portfolio trade. It does take a lot of sitting on your hands. It takes a lot of uh, sometimes what seems like upside risk reward, up, upside down risk reward. But especially as you get nearer and nearer to where things should be playing out, and you can see down here, for the whole time I'm playing down these measured moves as well as this big median line that ran the whole way down. We're getting closer and closer to reality. The risk reward has turned so far around; it's one eighteenth now, versus at one point it was uh, twenty four to one. So I put in a one one oh three eleven bid, put my stop up here. So if I got stopped out, I'd be—I uh, think I put it at one eleven, eleven. I'd still take home thirteen cents. And remember, only a third of this is left. Yes, Paul says with all respect, you know, and you don't, you don't, you can just be honest, brutally honest, guys. You don't ever have to say anything like this. But with all due respect, don't don't bother to say that part. I think it turned from a trade into being, 
you're beating Canada down to parity. <laughs> that's even, I think that's right. And he said, I even remember you using the phrase, it's personal now. As a matter of fact, Paul, um, that's, I think that's exactly right. And I think on, on Monday, I want, you know, this is no longer, I'm not rational. And now, I think I could see it because I'd finally, I'd already met with the doctors. And at that point, I went, you know, not only am I not rational, I'm ill. And it gave me an excuse to be rational. So you have to be careful of, oh, you, oh, it's, you know what, Mark? I think it's, Mark says he wants his hat again, glow mug. I still think it's going to parody, but I don't care. It's going to parody. We'll all be getting mugs. I'll be paying beer. Jennifer's going to be delivering it. Trust me. I still think that's true. But that has nothing to do with the trade. And that's the point I wanted to make. The trade has to remain a trade, and your thoughts can't get in the way. Once your thoughts get in the way, as Paul said, when it becomes me beating down Canada, it's personal now, at that point, you're no longer seeing the trade. That's right. This is a business. So at that point, I went, you know, I'm I'm being stubborn now. I'm going to put a bid in here at 103.11, and I'm going to put a stop in where they should be, not at 119. Now let's go back to trading, and let's see what happened. This is, I think, when we came in. We got one run down, and now look at it. I got filled. Yahoo. And that's where we are today. So I'm out. I'm happy. Lucy's more than happy. Now I can go away. If you lose it, Andy says, this is a good lesson for all of us. Sometimes you lose objectivity. Yes. The moment you realize that you've lost objectivity, find a graceful exit from the trade. And you can always come back once you find it again. So would I re-enter? You know what I'm getting That's a good question, Ron. Um, Paul said, right, and I think right, rightly so, at the moment I should be in a no-trade zone. I need to clear my head. Personally, I'm not well. One of my rules is when I'm not well, I don't trade. Um, if I have portfolio trades that have a lot of money in them and have good stops, I tend to let them run. But um, when I'm not well, and I'm certainly not well now, I don't trade. I'm not at 100%. You don't get in the ring, um, you know, unless you're well. So the trick is self-awareness uh, to realize that you have lost objectivity. Absolutely. Well, please have a look at some other stock market index, tra uh, FTSE, DAX, or Nikkei. Uh, maybe, Krishna. Maybe. It's a maybe. If the structure shows a good setup and I'm well, Ron, I will re-enter. We'll look at it, and I'll show you entries. If I'm feeling better and I think I'm well, uh, then I'll trade again. In the meantime, I think I'm flat. I'll stay flat for now. Yes, this is absolutely the master yourself part. It does add stress, sure, uh, as, as well as my health problems. Uh, and also, I'm trying to move all at the same time. So all a bad combination. So anyway, hopefully you got something on. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hopefully you got something out of this discussion on Monday and me coming to a realization uh, later in the session that, you know, I'm being stubborn and putting in a bid and putting in my stop where they should be. It's like a snap back to reality and saying, uh, you know, this has become personal. I need to put, I need to treat this as a business, put the trade entry orders in where they should be, exit orders in where they should be. And that's, uh, that's how you all should trade. Don't trade what you think. Don't make it personal. Like the stock market. I would have lost a lot of money if I just stuck with my, you know, I think it's over. Well, I don't know if I lost a lot of money, but you get the idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mary, if it cleans up nice, you can put it in the knowledge expansion pack. It's good. Hey, Scotty. Well, we'll see. if I don't know if this is the best lesson yet, but we'll see. Hopefully there's better ones coming. How's that? Let's look at some markets. So Canada now. See, I'd much rather be out than worried about what it's going to do when it gets to this baseline, huh? Switch back once. However, it's not coming back to fill the mountains. It's leaving higher lows and higher highs. Canada tends to do this beautifully. And you want to re-enter... You know, if you're trying to get long Canada short U.S., you want to re-enter at some point if it if it's out of control. Whether it's up here, that's maybe that's a maybe. 
uh, and you have a stop that's not bad over here, or up here, if it leaves a stop for you, something like that, you want it to be stretched. That's when I, that's when I like to get in Canada. Andy says it helps me to think of each tick as a new trade. Oh, I like that. That's in, in fact that's what I'm actually trying to get all of you. Uh, when we do bar by a bar, I'm trying to get you all to think about it that way. You know, there's nothing on the chart as each new tick unfolds. Pay attention to each each bit of information as it comes out. Instead of, you know, oh, a couple bars later you take a look casually. A couple bars later you take a look casually. Eduardo says, how about the no man's land between two pitchforks up and down? How do you look at that area? Um, let's see. Let's, let's, let me, I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind. Let's look at some other markets. And uh, I'll see if I can grab one for you, Eduardo. Hang on. Uh, that's a good question. But it's best if I could answer it with a... Oh, talk about a mess. Hey, we got our pullback. Look at that. Beautiful. You beauty. Right back to the switchback. Can we see that? I was just about to race everything. All right, so here's our center lines that we drew in yesterday. Here's the center line, the lower median line parallel. What I said was, will it stop here? Sure, sure it did, right at the energy point. And now we come right back to the switchback, which is this downsloping upper median line parallel. Gave us a V bottom. So let's call on the tune still so this red fork which everybody was ready to pitch the warning lines paul are you here yeah you are here i know we've already talked almost like i knew yeah but see that's when you get fooled by the uh philip says do i consider news i'm asking because canada rail us dollar canada rail the other day because of interstate news um no i don't i just print out the time of news. I have no idea what's coming out. I don't really care. I think it's in price. How's that? Um, Paul, what I was going to point out, I'm going to... Uh, uh, Paul? Ready? We're going to call these Paul entries. <laughs> ah, no. Let me see if I can get rid of this for a second. Hang on. Well, I'll leave that circle on. Paul has a proclivity. Well, you can, if you want to use your last name, or PCs. I'll let you choose the term, but it's going to be tied to you. How's that? Go ahead and grow in a moment. I don't care. Paul has a proclivity in mentoring. I'm giving out names. I gave a craft one, although he would like me to not call it the craft line. He wants me to call it the crap line. <coughs> No. Um, Paul has a proclivity for trading. He loves it when they break, when you get some nice moves off of these media lines. He waits for this move back to the first warning line. Then he loads his gun, and he looks for a beautiful test to retest. And look at this one right here. Test, retest. And look at the nice stop, and look at the action off of it. And he comes right back to the switchback and takes his money and says, Thank you very much. No. <laughs> Uh, Paul, it, has, it can't be that long, and I have to be able to pronounce it. <laughs> I, I I believe it. I, I yes, there's a there's a yes, I, it, it there's a a, a book. I, I won't I won't say the author's name, but Outer Quigmalion he calls that by the way. But that it's like an exhaustion of the market. Ron Carlson says yes. Anyway, this will be Paul will come up with the name for this. Paul, you get to name this entry. And, but not but not with a Welsh name. <laughs> so anyway, see so it come up to the warning line, takes out a low, retests, he's there with both barrels, takes the money off the switchback. And it's a beautiful, I've seen, in the last couple of weeks I've seen, I don't know, 10 of these from him. It's absolutely beautiful. So, Paul, you owe us a name tomorrow, by tomorrow. Um, I want to get to Eduardo's question, which is, what, what if we're in the middle of nowhere? So if Bond's here, it'll be interesting to see. They didn't make their date with the outer warning line here. Whether they'll hit this outer warning line and stop and turn again, or whether, you know, in this diamond that they're in, where are they going? 
they've they've done their bit here now at the switchback. Will they hit here and then come back down? I mean, we're, we're, the problem is the diamond is now getting so small it's almost untradeable. But we'll see. Be to see how that plays out by Friday. Do we have anything out today, guys, other than unemployment claims? Should I always should you always wait for at least one retest? That's a style matter, Daryl. If you have just unemployment, okay. Claims or unemployment, unemployment. Um, Daryl, if you have a stop with market structure up above, for example, um, you could sell here at this test of the red line with a stop above this prior high. If you want to just sell a straight test. Retests are, are a little bit more reliable, just so you know. Leading indicators at 9 uh, central, okay, as well as unemployment claims. So so you get about 7% uh, more probability by selling the retest as as opposed to the test. But you also get about 20% less trades. So hopefully that will help. Let's look at another one. Let's look at, uh, just for those of you with... Uh, Meta, well, I guess we haven't marked this one up in a while, huh? For Meta stock, here's a 30-minute chart, and let's. Uh, there we go. This is yen. 30 minutes. And you know, let me refresh because Caitlin and I were. Uh, looks like I finished it. Okay, Caitlin and I were working on lots of things. Bernanke speaks before the market open tomorrow. What, at the World of Warcraft uh, convention? But you know, the San Francisco Chronicle has been awful quiet. I wonder, if, I wonder if the guy quit paying the $99. Remind me on Mondays to make a comment. I'm sure he still comes in three days. So, you can see here, there ain't nothing off of that. So, I'm going to go to a secondary. Here's the low. I'm going to go to a secondary high and low. I'm going to call this a secondary pitchfork. Low, high, low. Well, that's not bad. Nice test. And retest. here's our retest or test. That's within Carlos's rule. You get here. That stops awful far, though. Let's open this up. There. A uh, bit of news. Let's see. Um, Paul has been working with Carrie, who uh, is the inventor and the owner of Omnium Chart Overlay, and we will soon have A, a new and improved Omnium over the chart overlay for everybody, and B, have a special deal for members. So, yes, I'll get to the parallel lines coming. And um, thank you, Paul, for all that effort, and it's going to have sh modified shifts and inside media lines, which uh, um, I'm apparently the only person that teaches those. We're going to use those. Uh, we'll certainly be teaching them in the advanced seminars because... They go hand in hand with uh, action reaction lines, but we'll also be working on them here. And you can see the parallel is, is a beauty. In fact, let's play this game. So we need 150, and we need. 125. Mm, even the 125 is not bad. It's off, but it's not bad. What about a median line shift? What about it? Let's look at it. Um, has merits. You know, it shows you the probable path of price, but it really doesn't generate much in the way of trades. Um, anybody like this? You like this fork better? Let's vote. 
Which which would I like better? Yeah, I generally yeah I generally put up both. Yes, you can. So you'll be able to bang or do all these lines on any on any image that anybody shows you. Somebody sends you an image, or you, you take a co- screen copy from something here. You can then draw all the lines you want right on it. Modified shifts, median median lines, parallels, um, action reaction lines, all kinds of stuff. It's a great little product. Okay, now. Let's see what else we have before we head out here. So, we've got, if we look to the left, oh, let's make that red for topish. And you can see we came up and busted the top. Now, you remember I said, uh, is the overlay software a purchase or a subscription? It's a cheap purchase. And it'll be, you're going to get, I don't know, Paul, what is it, whatever, it's some percentage off. It's, it's going to be a great deal. It's, it's, first of all, it's incredibly cheap. I'm shocked he's able, he actually sells it as cheap as he does. Um, but second of all, you're also going to get, I don't know, some 25 or 30% discount on top of that. So it's, you know, if you can't afford that, you shouldn't be, you can't afford to come here to the sessions, first of all, and you certainly shouldn't be trading because it's really, really, really cheap. And we'll announce it. it it'll, I think we'll be seeing the trial version in about a week. So we'll be announcing it shortly. And he's building it for us, the people here in the, in the membership, by the way. He's got a small audience he's like to get, like when he wants to get it bigger. And so he appreciates uh, the support. Paul reached out to him. Thank you, Paul. And uh, he uh, responded immediately. So now remember on, yeah, it's way cool, isn't it? That he's building it for us. All right, now remember... It's not, yeah, is it seventy nine ninety five? Well, think of that with a 25 or 30% discount. There you go. Chart overlay does action reaction lines too. Well, wait till you see the new one. The new, new one's going to do all kinds of cool things. And you'll be able to upgrade. Don't worry. Um, remember on, I don't know, was it Tuesday when I came back from the doctors and I was explaining exactly what disease I had and they have something called a, in my lungs, this disease leaves something called a, bleb anybody remember that yeah blebs yeah right so when we get um if this ends up being a high a major high and we come down and retest let's say uh well we already are just about to retest this lower median line parallel or the sliding parallel excuse me you know how it leaves these tells up here these little pokes and they're not wash and rinses they're too wide to be washed and rinses right Everybody see that? A wash and rinse would be, uh, you know, just a few bars, like this. Maybe if we had this right here, let's say I drew this line in here, if I can get it right. Let's see if you can see the difference. Let's say, let's say I had this as a major balance line, and you had the one or two bars hanging down there. That's a wash and a rinse, okay? This, with all this action up here, there's a lot of price action up here. It's like it's it's busted wide wide open, and then we come back into where it should be, right? And sometimes you can. This is a tell of where the market's likely to go. I'm going to call these blebs. I I can't remember any term that I've actually named myself, but I'm going to call these blebs. This is my one homage to myself. Somewhere deep in my lungs, there's lots of these. And they're causing my problem. And hopefully, hopefully we found the tell for all my disease. So I'm going to call these blebs, these little pokes above that turn out to be nothing. And hopefully this will all turn out to be nothing, okay? And I'll show you, I'll show you some better examples. I have some of mine. Can I expand so you can see the bar? Sure. So it's, there's too much price action. There's too much closing up here. For this to be nothing. However, if price now comes and heads down here, you're going to look back at this and say, uh, was there a tell there? So I'm going to call these that stick out in the middle of nowhere that end up being hopefully meaningless blebs. <laughs> Shabir said, would the adjective blebbing also be valid? Absolutely. In fact, many days I do bleb. 
Is any line more powerful in attracting price than another? The median line parallel versus the range line versus action reaction line, etc. Um, once action reaction lines are proven, they are the same as median lines or median line parallels. Median lines and median line parallels have validity, we know statistically, from the ABCs that you choose them, so they are automatically start out the same. And I would say the sliding parallels or the range lines, um, the sliding parallels have the same validity as the uh, parallels and the median lines. The range lines, per se, uh, they don't have quite as high a probability, um, probably about 15% less, but they attract price quite well. The problem is they're very sloppy. I'll think about it, Claudio. You might be right. When you have three tops in a row like that, isn't that a sign of reversal soon to come? Three tops in a row like that. Damien, uh, exp expand on that, will you, Damien? Yes. Mark, Mark says, yesterday I was talking about sliding parallels. You said that you use the first poke through is where the sliding turns directions. The first bar pokes through. But I also said, hang on. Let me come back. And then, Damien, you, you expound. What I also said, this is, learn to use the price scale, Tim. You can do it. I also said, when you get up in here, when it first pokes through right here, you put it in, Okay. Then if it blows through, forget the sliding parallel idea. And this is in terms of quick entry. That would then erase it because we, it's blown through, and you can see it's just walked right through it. Because otherwise you're just moving the line in the sand. Now take it out. Now if prices come and, let, and test it a couple times, at that point now you can draw it in here, I think. Maybe here, but certainly here. And say, okay, it's, call, it's holding action all right. And now it's, a, it's almost like a channel with the same frequency as this median line. They are both called sliding parallels, but they have two different functions. This is the cause when you see exhaustion move down, it should hold. If it doesn't, quit drawing the line in the sand. When you see several formations that have a similar slope, then go ahead and connect them. It's almost like a trend line. How's that? Does that help you, Mark? Do I have and do I attach any significance to the closed equally the open and some bars? Yes, I market indecision. Yeah. All right. So Damien says the one at ninety one fifty. Just give me a second here, folks, because I want. I think he's asking an important question, but I'm a little slow here this morning. Ninety one fifty seven. Okay, 91.24, this one, are you talking about three drives to the top? Yeah, you're talking about one, two, three drives to the top, okay. Um, one, two, three, well, or one, two, three, however you want to call it. This is a three, dr three drives to the top on the downside, and Damien, I think you're relatively new. There's actually a whole knowledge expansion pack that's going to come with a DVT that does three drives to the bottom. One, two, three drives to the bottom. Three drives to the top, the fourth or fifth, whatever, breaks. So here's our three drives to the bottom, here's our three drives to the top, and a break, which gives us one, two, three, and also one, two, three. So we're working on, ready? Once again, one, two, three drives to the top, which is what Damien was asking about. And we're working on one, two, we're making our third drive to the bottom. Or you could, you, it's up to you, you could count it. One, one of these or both of these is one drive to the bottom, two drives to the bottom, three drives to the bottom, and one of these is not going to hold. And this is mar demarcated by the sliding parallel. This is by this three drives to the top line. When one of these breaks, of course, then you look for a position. That makes sense. You're, you're in good. You're good, Damien. Yep. No, you're you're fine. They're not exact. Sometimes they're three, four, and it's you know, 
Dr. Anderson, I, I relate all this back to Dr. Anderson, who was the head of mathematics at MIT when Andrews was there. Um, he did all these counts at the same time that uh, there's a very famous person that you guys all know doing counts that has all these goofy explanations about the one, two, three, the little eyes, one, two, threes, and if it doesn't do that, then it's a backward CB, whatever, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of that, Dr. Anderson said, you know, these counts should be loose. And they should be one, two, three-ish. There might be a four in there. Um, you should be able to count them several different ways. Just relax and, you know, let them be loose. And they did a lot of mathematical studies. And they, and they found that it makes, it works better if you, if you let them be loose. So we've got, to, we've got the three drives to the top here, three drives to the bottom. Now we're at three drives to the top, three or four drives to the bottom, but it's still holding on this sliding parallel. If this sliding parallel holds... And this blows through, then you should be looking for longs. But you're also going to have problems, you can see, at this upper parallel. So we've kind of boxed in price here. Does the fact that the third drive to the top did not reach the midline parallel portend a bearish move? Good question, Gerald. Um, I basically look at it this way. If it makes it within about 90%, um, I'm okay with that. The problem I have with this move at the moment is, if you look, we're becoming less and less efficient against this blue line. If you took the blue line and tilted your screen so the blue line was horizontal, we'd actually, we actually, in a downtrend, so to speak, these highs are lower, first of all. Second of all, this blue line has become a switchback. That worries me. That leads me to think, A, we are going to see, excuse me, a test of this uh, sliding parallel. And B, more likely, I think we're probably going to see this sli this uh, first warning line. How about that? The pivots are tightening up as well. Yeah, slope, yeah. <laughs> Dallas says, I always laugh when I hear you explain Elliott wave, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know what? My eyes, when when guys try to explain their Elliott wave count to me, my eyes glaze over. This is the third of the C of the whatever, and then I go, what the? Do I know Prector? <laughs> uh, I know I know too many people. Yes, and. Um, I'm not going to throw any stones, and the reason why is, uh, you know, unfortunately I have been dragged, because I agreed to talk at places like Traders Expo, I've been dragged into making predictions, because you can't, you, when people ask you on camera, you can't just say, I'm not sa I'm not doing it. So, so I'm not going to laugh at him, because I used to make fun of him, but actually, every once in a while, you got, yeah, everybody has to make a living. Every once in a while, you get forced into making a prediction, and you go afterwards, what the heck was I thinking? Multiply that by XYZ and you get Elmo's world. There you go. I lost dollars shorting housing stocks during the crash. You get Elliot, oh, an idiot wave. And that was your associate, the end of your association. I like that, Michael. Elliot wave equals Elmo's world. Think your 5,500 that was haunting you, Tim? Krishna, not really, because look at it this way, Krishna. I said 5,500 when it was 13,500. Nobody else was saying that. Doesn't bother me at all. I, I'm sorry, I missed it by 900 points. Sorry. <laughs> no, I know, Krishna. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, you know what? I'm going to even talk about Robert Prechter's trading. As I said before, you only know somebody's trading if they're trading for you in your account or you see audited trading accounts. So I have no idea. I'm not even going to bother to go there. Do I ever consider indicators like RSI stocks? Uh, stochastic, SMACD, etc. Daryl says, no, I don't. I know them well because of my mathematics background. I have a PhD in mathematics, but uh, having done work on them, they're lagging indicators. They're not useful for me. If they work for you, go ahead and use them. In fact, I have people in mentoring that use them. I'll help them learn, use, learn how to use the tool correctly, but um, I don't need them. They're lagging tools. Andy says, I teach you guys how to fish. Most of these other guys usually always want you to just continually always depend on them. Yeah, that's, that, that's true, I guess.
Well, you know, I don't get Bob's uh, newsletter, so I'm going to just leave it out. I have no idea. You know, I, I, I it doesn't, it just, it doesn't matter to me whether he's right or wrong. I, I'm not anti-Bob. How about that? You want Pop Tart Boy? <laughs> Him, you depend on. Okay, he'll be down in a few minutes. Here you go. From personal experience, Paul says, having good forecast charts is extremely different from being a good trader. That's exactly right. What I want to teach you guys how to do, and I've said this a, normal, a, nor, a, num, a number of times, I can teach you how to draw pristine charts that will give you magnificent projections. Or I can teach you how to draw charts that will make you money. Which do you want? I always choose money. In fact, yeah, in fact, on Monday, you don't, AK says, I'm going to call you on this, AK. Okay, okay, you're laughing out loud, okay. But I was going to call you on it. AK says, it's not about making money. Then he came back and said, I'm kidding. I actually, I'll tell, I'll tell you a real quick one. Here you go. Um, and the reason I went back up over Monday was because at some point it, on Monday, when we were talking about stops in Canada, it quit being about money and it was about being right. And that's at the point when you're wrong as a trader. It's about making money. This is about making money. Period. Eduardo says, money, of course, but good setup is good setup. No. Yes, that's partly true. However, let's look at the Carlos rule. And I haven't seen Carlos in all. He must be on vacation. You know, going inside the lines, if you can afford the stop, is a perfect example. If you're very pristine, I know guys that trade, for example, I'm going to pick on them. I, I have guys that live on Wall Street in little bitty uh, shacks. They make millions of dollars. But they, if, they were, if they were following the type of work that I do, and they had this pink line here, and they wanted to buy this pink line, let's say uh, here with a stop underneath here, they would put their bid in on the exact tick of the pink line, and I don't care what happened, they would not move. Two ticks inside, one tick, and they would nothing. It, there's no way because if it doesn't come down here, it's not to them. It's not a valid trade, and I just think that's silly. I'm reading. Hang on a second. It is about trading. Paul's Paul's gone through an interesting thing. How about? Ah, AK, that's a great... How about that? Do people think the Hunt Brothers or Goldman Sachs or KKR were worried about pristine projection charts? That's the question people need to ask. No, they were thinking about making money. Or T. Boom Pickens, how about that? T Tom says, at what point do I move my limit order by a tick or two above the line? I love Carlos's... Tom, you may not have been in when Carlos said this trade within your stops which is i'll use a minimum i never in currencies i never trade any stop less than 10 pips or ticks so if i go and take a look and say you know this stop is seven pips or ticks i'll probably go inside the line to make sure i get filled and put my stop at 15 ticks because you know i want to be outside the noise and i might as well trade inside the line as well a little bit I, I've, you know, I'm already working on T Boone. Uh, he's reluctant to be interviewed, but I told him these are private and they don't get, so we're working on him. I don't know. If, if nothing else, maybe we'll get it for knowledge expansion. Excuse me, let me, uh, whew. Um, Rita says, Good morning, Tim. Speaking of making money, when deciding to enter on a retest, at what point does one enter? That is, the bar that is forming or after it is formed. I'm a little confused about how to enter. I like, okay, let's say, you see, okay, let's widen this one out. This is a good example. Let's look at this bar here. If we take a look at this bar here, this is our test. This could be your test as well, by the way. But let's say you're choosing this bar as the test. And the reason I like this one is because it leaves this little nipple below. You see that? And that's good for a stop because the sellers tried to push it down and they got pushed right back up. It closes on the line, so I don't want to buy that. 
But now when it closes up here and shows some separation, now I'm interested in buying, especially up in here. This takes out this high to the left. So now I've had my test right here. With me, Rita? Stay with me, Rita. Everybody else stops typing for just a second. Okay. So now I've got my test. I've got now I'm interested because it's taken out this high. It's shown some strength, if you will. So now I put my order in at the line. I've got my test. I want to buy the retest. I put my order in. I just put it in the market. When it makes this high, now I put an order in. I just run the cursor along, put an order in the limit buy order right here. Then I move over here, run my cursor down, put the limit buy order here. I might move it over. Maybe it has to come up a pip. Then I'll come over here. Before this bar forms, when this bar is forming, I'll move my order, I'll go move my cursor over one more bar where it would form. Let's say now it's got to be one more pip higher, and I'll move it up here. Okay, as this bar comes down, I've already got my limit buy order in. I'm filled. My stop goes underneath this little nipple. So I have those orders in the market. Does that make sense, Rita? The stop would be underneath this nipple, David. Did that answer the question, Rita? Because that's a very important fundamental question. So I got three people that wanted that wanted that answer. If if this confuses anybody. Ask now because this is a really important. So you do trailing buy limit orders. I adjust them because this line is sloped. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Eduardo? Examples to the left. But okay, so I'm taking a chance that that bar could go lower as it's forming. Absolutely. This this bar where you're getting long? Sure, absolutely. But your stop's already in the market, all right? You put in an order to buy at, let's look at it. Here. Here we go. This forms and leaves a nipple, okay? The, the low is 90, 90.84. No, I got that wrong. The low is, or the close is 9084 at the low is 9075 okay at the next bar i'm going to buy at i would be buying if i was buying but i'm not ready to buy yet i'm buying at 9084 now it comes up and it takes out this high right here and that's a swing high right here see it when we take that out when that bar closes up here with great separation now i go okay now i've had my test now i've got a sign of strength and i've got great separation so before this bar even starts to form, I go right back down here and move over the width of one bar, and I say I'm going to get long at 90.86. And my stop's going to be below 90.75. So I'm going to put my stop at 90, I think 90.69. Okay? With me so far? 86, stop at, at uh, 69. Now... As this bar forms and is getting ready to close, I move my cursor up, and now I'm going to 90.88, same stop. As this bar forms and closes, I move my order to 90, it's still at 90.88. So I'm going to get long at 90.88. My stop's going to be six ticks below this low, 75, so I'm going to be at 69. So 88 to 69. Are you with me? Does the close or high only need to be above the swing high? It doesn't have to be a close. It just has to break this. But I really like that it closed. It makes me happier that it closed up here. But it just is, I, I wanted to just show some strength. Show me their buyers that will take out a high. That's all. Eduardo says, are you cool doing two-thirds staggered orders? One above the line, one at the line, one below, all with same nipple stop? Sure, you could do that. That's fine. As long as it's in your plan when you do the trade. But if you put a buy in at the bar before the nipple, with a stop a bit below the bar before, no, Mark, you're missing it. This is the bar that I'm going to use for the stop. I'm not interested in getting long until here. And the stop's going to be underneath here. It, when it takes out, here, let me draw it. Here's my swing. When it takes out that high, Especially when it closes up here, I'm excited. I like this now. Now, I want to get long. Let's just let's just do it. Let's just do the. Let's just do it as this as if we're nitwits. 
Let me draw all the lines. Okay. I want to get long. Add a test, and I'm going to start out here. Then I'm going to move it here. Now I'm going to move it here. You can see me moving the orders. My stop is always going to be. Oops. Let me clone this. 69. I put the stop in before, at the same time I put this first order in. So my first order is going to be here. I've got the same stop in. I leave it in. Now I move my stop up to here. Now I check and make sure if it's the same, I leave it here. It's 9088. Okay? My stop is underneath this nipple here and never changes. Everybody get that? I put my stop in the same time I put my order in. On my platform, I can park orders. So what I do is I type in the stop, and I type in the first entry order, then I enter them at the same time, then I cancel and replace my limit by every time. So your realization that the test has occurred happens until the high is taken out. Well, if I'm ultra bullish, I might... The reason why I think this is important is because at this point we're kind of coming down. So I wanted to take out a high to show me that this little bit of consolidation that's making lower highs is ending. That's why I wanted to take out a high. But in point of fact, if I'm dying to get long, as long as it gives me separation, I might buy the retest. Um, but da -da -da -da. How far down from that low is your stop? It's six pips. I use five to seven pips in general underneath the structure. You move your retest order until you can't afford it. That's exactly right, Tom. At some point, if it, you know, at some point up here, you go, never mind, I can't afford it anymore. Nice entry happening here. Well, there might be a nice entry happening here. We need to see what's happening and where, where would your stop be? If you did it here, let's look. Uh, uh, uh. Maybe. The question is whether or not you have a stop here. You certainly you might have one here as well. So, it's a maybe. You have to see this bar close, I think. No, I already said, Theo, I don't like this bar because it's the test. And we're still coming down. I like this better because it left the nipple. Um, if you've, if you've, there's no lower, no lower separation. And, yeah, it hasn't scouted out the orders. This blows out the orders below this market. So now I know if we come back down here, we're not likely to run into sell orders of people that were long. This scouted out the area or blew out the orders. That's what I really like about these nipples. I suppose I should call these blebs, but you get the idea. Maybe we'll call those blebs. I don't know. You get the idea. Uh. Oh, Paul, I like that. The Christie. Okay. Okay. There we go. Unemployment came. Here we go. 531. We'll call them scouts. Okay. So the Paul trade on the warning line, we're going to call those Christie's. I like that. All right. Um, what was expected on unemployment? Anybody know? Let's look at another chart. It is 730. Let's go grab a commodity. Five fifteen. All right, so they're starting to go the other way now. Okay. So here we are in gold. We talked about this yesterday, these equidistant lines projected forward. You can see it fighting to get above the diamond. It just can't do it. turned into nothingness now. Let me refresh this to make sure. It's like I said, Catelyn and I were doing oh, it looks fine I guess. Catelyn and I were doing uh, a lot of work yesterday on this box. Huh. 
<laughs> AK says, if we call that trade those trades the Christie's, let's not use the word nipple in the same sentence. Yes, that's probably a wise idea. Um, you can see it fighting to get into the diamonds. Had trouble getting in, now broke in. Now it's trying to break out on the upside over here. Breaking, breaking out here, but it's just being held in. And now we're now we're in the dangerous part in here. You've got support below that's holding. You've got resistance above that's holding. You want to wait for it to make its move before you do anything. So gold's a no trade at the moment. Too undecided, yep. Paul said, not only nipples, please don't talk about rounded bottoms. Okay. <laughs> in, in conjunction with Christie's. Okay. I got it. All right. So let's look at... Uh, just for chuckles, natural gas, but oh, this is continuous though. Let's look at a uh, let's look at a, a month. Where is my here's my Novi natural gas? All right. Everybody's all hot about natural gas over at Stock Twits. Blow off bar closes below the line. This is a wash and rinse, in my opinion. I'm gonna mark. Oh, hey, nice, nice typing, buddy. And I just wonder. No, see, Matt, that's not fair. Your girlfriend now thinks that I'm a smarmy old man, huh? Okay, Daryl, wash and rinse. <laughs> We have this beautiful market structure here, and it doubles the range. And we've got this double top here, right? So when the market bounces off of the middle line and heads back higher, there are limit sell orders right here. Then people not only get stopped out of their short positions that they enter right here when it comes up here, but people that are breakout buyers get long up here. So somebody with a lot of muscle and natural gas pushes through the orders, Stops people out of their short orders. Stops people into their long orders that are going to be limit. They should be that are going to be uh, breakout buyers. Gets them all long. Now they're all long. Everybody gets long this market. Then he sells. And that washes and rinses the short positions out. Washes people into long positions that are breakout buyers. Now they're left holding the bag as he pushes it lower. Yes, we had we had nice tests of support. I agree. The question is whether or not two bars from now. We'll look. We'll come back and look at this. The reason I washed it, I actually, I should mark. I should do this. To be fair, I should do this. Is this a wash and rinse? I'm not old. Okay. <laughs> um, is this a wash and rinse? And we'll come back and we'll visit this Friday and Monday and take a look. The purpose of wash and rinse is, is market makers, guys that know the deck steal money from you. You were short, you had a good position, they have just enough money to push it up there, get you out of your position, they take the short, now it's down here, they have your position, you have nothing. Now if you want to get short, you're going to have to push the market down in their favor. That's the purpose of the wash and rinse. They use your position, they take your position away, then they use you trying to chase the market to push your position that's now in their hands to the area that they want it to go. You get ahead of the wave, so to speak. And natural gas is certainly one of those manipulated markets where there's people that are big enough players that they can do this. There you go. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Are we good now? Okay. 
Sorry about that. Um, let's see. We'll go. Uh, okay. So, Jay said, "Do they risk this, risk their money for a small change?" Look, a guy. If this was lumber, not natural gas, he might do twenty five thousand contracts. Because, but remember, he's holding the deck. He can see all the orders. He can see the limit sell orders and their stop losses above them. And he can see the guys that are stop loss buyers that are breakout buyers. He's got, literally got the orders in his hand. Okay? So he's not risking anything. So, so he buys 25,000 contracts. He runs through all these orders. That makes him short. Then he sells another 25,000 contracts, gets it down here for the close. Now all these people have to put up margin because they're in the hole. Right? The next day, it tries to go higher, and they're all there because they just want to just get me out. I don't care. They're all screwed. That's exact. That's a technical term, chef. Yes, yeah, screwed. And so that's why there are limit sellers here because they do, oh, just get me out of here. I want out of this market. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see because it's funny, as I said, the guys at Stock Twits on Monday were talking, everybody was talking about it's time to buy natural gas. And these are hedge fund guys. It's time to buy natural gas. I just wonder if they all got into their position at once and it ends up being a wash or rinse. will be interesting. What class of traders gets to see all the orders? Well, as it becomes more and more electronic, we don't that disappears. But there are still pits. And the pit guys, the brokers have dual badges, they get to see the orders. Is this a wash and rinse of buy orders or sell orders? Uh, well, in this case, it was a matter of both. They, he, got, he got them to buy... Well, excuse me. He got them to sell first, right here. So they get short here, right before these orders. Then he knows that they have stop buy orders up here. And there's also buy orders from people that are breakout buyers so he pushes it out he lets them get short then he pushes them up here they they buy themselves out of their short order then some people get long because they're breakout buyers then he pushes it back down and the people that wanted to be short are now angry and they're looking to get short so when it comes back up here they get rid of their longs and they try and get short and that's what this action is the question is now t today and tomorrow what will we get in this bar? Will this continue back up or will we head lower? It's a true wash and rinse if we falter and start to head back down. This could just be a one or two day pause and then it'll head up. Well, we won't know yet. How do you handle if you had your sell at the retest? You'd just be, Mark, you'd just be screwed. You remember that technical term we just talked about? Screwed. Because where would your stop be? Your stop's blown. That's the truth. There's nothing you can do about it. Listen, I get washed and rinsed. Happens. There's nothing you can do about it. Sometimes it happens in normal markets. Sometimes it happens in the S&Ps. Somebody takes a look at it and says, you know what? This market formation is ripe, and I have enough money, and I'm just going to go ahead and try and run it and try and get short as it runs through the top here. So it happens. I guess waiting for the nipple is safer. Yeah, if you don't have a stop, that's why I tend to always use market. If you have market structure, you'll have more orders to hide behind. Selling against these tops, you tend to do get washed and rinsed more often, and that's why I say don't use a big stop because if you're wrong, this is going to happen. You don't want to waste this amount of money. Just put a tiny stop up here because you, if you're going to if you're going to get stopped out, they're going to play that game. Then you then you can go back in later on. Yeah, like the Royal Bank of Canada, buddy. Yes, absolutely. There's a guy that goes, I know exactly where this is going. Let me step out of the way, push the orders, and come right back. Paul says, I think I would have bought the next bar after the test in that chart, meaning it would have dropped away and given an opportunity to put a stop at the entry. Friends, you know, your friends to knife in the back, as Carlos says. That's exactly right, Chef. Absolutely. Can we look at the mini NASDAQ? Sure. Purple median line. Oh, okay. 
you you you're looking for a switchback. Okay. Let's go to the. Uh, we're, we're just about done. Pop tart boil beer soon. I'm sure. I can hear. I can hear him running around upstairs. Do, 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 do. Here's the Dow. Wide range bar lower. We'll just have to see. Was there a uh, particular frequency you wanted in the mini Nasdaq, Daryl? Twenty minutes. Uh, okay, I'll have, to, I'll have to make that one up. I don't normally look at mini Nasdaqs in uh, time base, but that's okay. If you do, that's fine. Twenty minutes. And here's why I don't. <laughs> look at the look at the. Watch this. Let me just make sure. Okay, here's here's a twenty minute chart. Ain't nothing there. Whole lot of nothing, right? Everybody with me? Now watch this. Let's take time out of the equation. And we'll go to 1444. And by taking the time out, let me refresh just to make sure. By taking the time out, computers are dumb. If you tell them to print a bar every 20 minutes, they just print a bar every 20 minutes. If you tell them instead to do every time it makes 1,444 ticks to put a bar in, then you get something that's much more tradable. It looks like this. Now compare those two charts for a second. Think about it. What is 1,444 and why that? Uh, 1,444 is Mark Anderberg said that he looks at 1444 so we started looking at them you could pick a frequency we want a number of ticks that draws nice flowing charts there's no particular significance to the 1444 but it's 1444 ticks which means up down up down up down each one of those is a tick but you can see why did I pick 1444 because as I said Mark Anderberg who trades NASDAQ mini NASDAQs all the time says that he looks at 1444 so I threw that in there here you go. He, Mark says he, <laughs> he uses 1444 as that was his cell phone number. There you go. Listen, if it works, it works. Look, uh, it, people ask me if I'm looking at, for example, when I got to a, a buck ninety in crude, which I trade, okay? This is ticks up and down, not contracts. That's exactly right. Here you go. Here's how I got to a buck ninety. Oh, that was his prison cell, Paul says. <laughs> oh my God! Anyway, um, when I, the way I got to a buck ninety is I was looking at what paints pretty pictures. I want it to be a beautiful flowing chart. I don't want it to be this. Let's go back to the twenty minute. That's that. This does nothing for me. I don't know about you guys. Which chart would you rather have? Fourteen forty four. Michael Jackson. Okay, here's a profound statement, and I will agree with you immediately. I'm beginning to believe that anything will work as long as you consistently use trade setups with good risk reward and trade management. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. No, it does have overnight. Oh, you. you oh, Phil. Wait, hang on. William Green says I just use opening price. Yep, I know some traders that do that. Philip says, tick charts rule. No, that's Peter. Yep. Uh, Philip says, I'm getting people confused here. Uh, Philip says, I use only the opening prices and not overnight prices. Okay. Well, in that case, then I would use a 39-minute bar chart, 8.30 to 3 o'clock, not 3.15, if that was me. Or a 13-minute, same thing. Yes, and I use 39. The reason why, Philip... From 8.30 to 3 is the cash chart, cash market, that's 390 minutes. Divided by 10, you get 39. Here, I'll show you one. And yes, you will have gaps. 
uh, right here. This is 39 minute, starts at 8.30, watch, data, day session only, this is wrong, excuse me, okay. Day session only, starts at 8.30, closes at 3 o'clock. This is a hedge fund, guys. This is, a, one of, this is one of our secrets. Why would I remove the last 15 minutes, Philip? Because the cash flow, I want to look at the cash flow, not the stock index flow. That last 15 minutes is just the retail market pushing each other around for the close. And Paul says it correctly, the right, charge, the, the right chart for you to use is the one that works for you. That's exactly right. Find one that works for you. Andy says, I use 1350 volume gold and 233 tick silver rather than time. There you go. And I got 1350 gold from Andy and Paul. All right? That makes sense? I will look at this sometimes. I'll look at stocks. If I look at a cash stock, somebody says to me, what do you think of Amazon? The very first thing I'll look at is 39-minute, day only, 8.30 to 3. I don't mind the gaps. I can work with the gaps. works for me. Uh, you might remember a couple weeks ago I did an Apple trade. Uh, it was probably more than probably four weeks ago. Um, did a beautiful Apple trade just on 39 minutes. Um these work very well. People are afraid of gaps. I don't know why. I think it. I think it tells all all you need to know. What was Paul's silver tick range? Two hundred thirty three ticks. Oh, Paul says the two hundred thirty three tick and silver came from my methodology, meaning me. I simply averaged twenty minute slots back over five years and found it to be two hundred thirty three ticks. Yeah, that's another way to do it. Go back and look at a number of years. See what the average is over a twenty minute time frame. See what the ticks are. Or if you want to do contracts traded, number of contracts traded, and then start from there. If it paints a pretty picture, use it. If it doesn't, use some variation of it. Mary says, chart time frames and what to use are one of the most common questions you get. We should put something together for the DVD. Yes, Mary, we should. Absolutely. Good idea. Will I do a lesson on gap trading? Sure, why not? Yes, Chan says he does his size for range charts the same way. Absolutely, Chan. So take a period of time and see what the average range is, and then just go ahead and grab it. I agree. So hopefully it's been a good session, guys. I hear the Pop-Tart boy coming downstairs, and he's still hot on oil, so there's really nothing for us to do. Yes, Paul, there's no way. For those of you that I haven't seen uh, Xi Ping yet today, but uh, Yuha might be here. Um, I will be at the University of Chicago today and tomorrow. Um, so, But I will be doing a, a morning session tomorrow. Then my wife will be taking me in for uh, breathing tests. So, All right, guys. Have a great day today trading. I'm doing my best. And uh, I'll talk to the Pop-Tarts if want and see what he thinks about oil. Maybe we'll have an update in the morning. Take care. I'm doing my best to get healthy. I'm Tim Morge. I'm out of here. Have a great trading day. Take care.